And I'm not sure if everyone heard me talking before. Really sorry for the Internet outage and the problems with the webinar today. We are going to have to move really quickly. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, AVAC, for supporting this call. Uh, Nick is an amazing activist, prep advocate. He is a documentarian. He's done a number of work, films and, and work around prep and HIV stigma. Um, he is going to be talking about prep in the wild in Germany. Nick, if you'd right. like to go ahead and take, take it away. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, that's perfect. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. For me here in Hamburg, it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm going to tell you about how PrEP is happening right now in Germany. Next slide, please. So the status quo of PrEP in Germany right now, we have no approval of tenofovir and emtricitabine as PrEP. And unlike France, who just decided we want PrEP and they have it, we here in Germany have to wait for the European Medicines Agency approval of Truvada as PrEP, which is expected to happen by the end of 2016. Yesterday I heard it might be as early as August. And if that approval has happened, then the individual member states of the European Union can adopt this approval, and before that, no official implementation steps will be taken in Germany. But approval doesn't equal reimbursement of the cost. Um, approval basically means that doctors can then prescribe PrEP officially. Um, if our health insurance companies will actually cover the cost, uh, will be decided by another committee. And there the question is if they consider PrEP to be a lifestyle drug, such as Viagra, and then you have to pay for it yourself. And 30 pills of Truvada in Germany cost around 820 euros. That is 930 US dollars. Um, or if they consider it to be a public health intervention, and then the costs might be covered. Right now, off-label prescription of Truvada as PrEP is possible in theory, but a lot of doctors are very hesitant to do so because of liability issues. So if their patient uh, suffers from severe kidney damage uh, because of PrEP, the doctors might be held liable. So right now, it's actually quite difficult to find a doctor who's willing to prescribe Truvada as PrEP. Next slide, please. So what's happening in the real-life wilderness of PrEP? Right now, it's mainly gay men who take PrEP. If you have heard of anyone else, uh, I only know of gay men who take PrEP. Some might take uh, or might seek to get PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, and then use it as PrEP. But it's not possible to do that a lot of times in a row, so there is no clinic hopping possible because we actually don't have sexual health clinics as such. You go to see your doctor and then uh, it would be reported to the, your health insurance so they would notice if you get the third, fourth or fifth round of PEP in a year. So what happens is that uh, people might get Truvada from friends who have HIV and who might just uh, have changed their therapy and have a bottle of Truvada left. I heard that there are some, for instance, people who inject drugs who are in dire economic situations who sell their Truvada that they got prescribed for treatment of HIV and sell it for uh, people on the black market. That black market is definitely happening. I heard of sex party packages where you pay an admission fee and that includes catering, condoms, recreational drugs and some pills of Truvada. But, uh, well, the, the real way of, of getting PrEP right now in Germany is to get generic PrEP via online pharmacies. German customs law don't allow you to have them shipped directly to Germany, so the United Kingdom is basically our gateway because there the custom laws allow to uh, an individual person to import those uh, generic drugs for personal use, and that is defined as a supply for three months. So you need an address in the UK, and then you can have your generics shipped to there. And then 
there are several ways of getting the drugs from the UK to Germany. The only legal way is you have to travel to the UK, pick up the drugs and bring them in your own luggage because that's the only way you're allowed to bring those drugs when you're traveling for your own personal use, again, defined as three months supply. Of course, that's quite a barrier for a lot of people. Um, the illegal way of getting those drugs to Germany is ask your friends in the UK to send them via mail to Germany. Uh, again, you just can't send drugs to Germany, but because it's all European countries, parcels usually don't get stopped by customs. What I hear, uh, what people are doing now, uh, and it's illegal, but it seems to work, there are parcel forwarding services. So you basically have a P.O. box address in the UK, and ha you, you have your drugs shipped to there, and then they forward the parcel to Germany. Of course, they are not allowed to ship medical drugs, so they ask you, so what's in this parcel? And then you say, it's dietary supplements, and then they ask you, and uh, how much uh, are they worth? And you say, let's say it's $50, because then customs won't be bothered. And I think that's the main route how uh, people in Germany access generic PrEP right now. Next slide, please. All this is possible without a prescription. The online pharmacies officially say, please do send us your prescription. But if you don't, they'll ship anyway. So um, it's not mandatory to have a prescription, so there is no real linkage to care. You don't have to see a doctor to get those drugs. Fortunately, the early adopters of PrEP, uh, well, they've basically done their homework. They know what are the crucial things to, to do when, when you take PrEP. So what's happening, they go to community-based testing facilities to get their HIV and STI tests done. But again, this is all voluntary. Um, for, as for uh, checking that your kidneys are fine with PrEP, uh, you can have your creatinine levels tested. For that, you have to go to a doctor's and have to pay for it yourself. Uh, the costs are not so high. A creatinine test in the lab costs around 10 US dollars. Um, if you're concerned about the quality of the generic drugs, you can have a TDM, therapeutic drug levels monitoring. Uh, that can also be done by doctors. That costs around 70 US dollars. Um, but there's hardly any official information <laughs> on PrEP available. The aid service organizations only provide, you know, the basic information about PrEP, the, the idea behind PrEP, but there's no information for people who want to start using PrEP or are already using PrEP. And, of course, there is no such thing as adherence support. Um, I've created a hidden Facebook group a while ago for PrEP activists, and I made sure there are only people in there who are really pro-PrEP. And in there, uh, we exchange information or people talk about uh, how they got PrEP. Uh, so that's kind of a support group for PrEP users in Germany. Next slide, please. Where's the PrEP advocacy in Germany at? Our Ministry of Health, unfortunately, is not very keen on PrEP. Basically, everything that is not condom-based, uh, they're just not interested they fear a rise of the other STIs, so that's something we have to work on. Our aid service organizations are finally getting on board, but I'd say in Germany we're probably still two years behind in the thinking about PrEP. It's got to do we never had a PrEP study, like in the UK or France, so, uh, but we're getting there. But right now it's individual activists like me who do the main work, we talk to people who, who talk to us on online dating websites uh, well, because we, we write in our profiles that we are on PrEP, and so we get messages like, oh, well, how do you do this? Uh, isn't that very expensive? Um, and so I think we could really use the PrEP in the wild survey data as evidence that a PrEP is happening in Germany and that there is a need for a more comprehensive 
information who people, for people who want to use PrEP now as a kind of harm reduction. And I think the reimbursement, as I said, will be our biggest challenge. I talk to a lot of people who are familiar with how our health system works. They're not very confident that the system will cover PrEP. Next slide, please. Public's perception of PrEP, um, yeah, the HIV sector, the moral debates are nearly over, and we now start talking about implementation. There, the biggest challenge would probably be how to link between the places where counseling can take place, which is usually at community-based settings, and then link people to places where they can actually get a prescription for Truvada, which is at doctors. And right now, there are no doctors at community-based testing facilities. HIV practitioners, many are still hesitant, I think in part for moral reasons. They still really want to focus on treatment as prevention. So they think if you can just identify all the people who have HIV, we put them on treatment and that will do the trick. Yesterday I heard that a survey done by the German HIV practitioners organization said that only 30% of HIV practitioners uh, would want PrEP to be covered by health insurance. Among the gay community, there are still mixed reactions, the slut shaming, but I think this is mainly because there is not enough information or education happening. As for the general public, it basically hasn't heard of PrEP yet. Uh, there were no major media coverage yet of PrEP, so we actually don't know what the public opinion about PrEP will be. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, we have, we're going to just do one very quick clarifying question, and then we have to motor ahead. We're going to move back to Midnight, who is now on the line with us. Nick, can you just quickly clarify what you mean by reimbursement? Um, paying for the cost of Truvada. So right now you can get a private prescription uh, that you fill in the pharmacy, but then you have to pay 820 euros yourself. And usually for prescription drugs, uh, those will be covered by your health insurance company. Uh, that's what I mean by reimbursement. Great. Thank you, Nick. Um, as we're move, getting uh, uh, midnight slides queued up, can I ask folks who are on the call, since we are on a, we're now open globally, we didn't do a global mute due to some uh, technical issues, if people can please mute their phone, the phone's mute function, or by pressing star six. We are hearing some background noise, coughing, you know, clearing of throats, etc. Please press star six or use your mute function on your phone to uh, allow us to have a clean recording. And now hopefully we've got Midnight ready to go. He is the Executive Director of APCOM, which works across Asia. They've been doing some really great stuff around PrEP, and I'm going to turn it over to Midnight now. Hello, good evening. I hope everyone can hear me. We can, Midnight. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks so much um, for staying on, and I apologize for, uh, for not being able to come in, uh, in the beginning. So uh, without further ado, um, so our name is Midnight. Uh, we've been working around um, community-led advocacy in, uh, in Asia and Pacific because um, you know, we've been involved with WHO for looking at rolling out some of the, uh, the, the, the PrEP recommendations from 2014 guidelines. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about what we've been doing. Next slide, please. So in the last year in September, uh, we, together with some development partners, did a community-led consultation on PrEP. So to discuss about what PrEP is and what it isn't, and it brought together over 100 people from the region, including from the community, uh, other civil society groups, government, policy makers, um, clinical health service providers, and development partners, to look at what are the barriers in, in terms of implementing PrEP in MSM in different countries across Asia because by that time it had been over a year and only Thailand was really doing anything around um, PrEP implementation. So we want to look at um, developing country advocacy plans that could be used for follow-up country discussions because we know that uh, a lot of the discussions have been you know, done in America and in, and in the West, but in terms of Asia, there's not been a lot of movement. 
And uh, for AFCOM, you know, we are, you know, representing the community's voice and actually trying to lead this from the community perspective. So as you can see here, we have some from like your advocate, you know, Chris Barrow from the uh, John Hopkins, uh, to talk more about you know why you know prep is effective, and then uh, the slide on um, the picture on the right is a current prep user who gives out um, Jonas from the Philippines who talks about why it's important for uh, for gay men like him to be able to access uh, another prevention tool like prep. Next slide, please. So as I said, the current prep programs uh, up until now has been Thailand with limited access and affordability issue because. Uh, uh, there's, uh, there's currently two, two projects going on. One is called PrEP30, which is run by the Thai Red Cross, where you pay uh, you know, about a dollar a day uh, for PrEP. And then there's also the uh, another research done by the Thai Red Cross on um, kind of like a, a test and treat. And then uh, Next Year MSM are also then offered uh, PrEP free of charge under that, under that scheme. In terms of what has been happening from the regional consultation, is that because we brought so many partners together and that has kind of ignited discussions at country level. So we were really pleased to, to hear that there's been some uh, discussion on implementation with the community and um, with um, program managers at country level in Laos, the Philippines, Indonesia, and uh, you know, in China, they're looking to have a consultation. Um, in, in Malaysia, they're going to have a consultation in, um, in May. And in India, I believe that they've just done their consultation now. So I think it has kind of like ignited some discussions around how it can be integrated with current um, service delivery models for prevention. And, and I think, um, you know, with, because it's community-led effort, then it's about how AFCOM educates our community to be able to then use that same information to go and talk to um, their service providers about accessibility to PrEP. What I think is really exciting about the Prep in the Wild survey is that because there is limited information at the moment about uh, you know, Prep in, in Asia and the Pacific, and particularly around informal use of Prep because it's very much um, done in a very close setting. So I think we'll find out some really uh, in, valuable information in terms of how Prep is being accessed by our community in, in various settings in Asia. And, but we've been hearing, uh, you know, from our communities that, you know, informal, uh, informal procurement of PrEP in various countries are done by, you know, purchasing from, from black markets and, and off the internet. So, you know, we'll be able to kind of like get some uh, evidence around, around this from our region, hopefully. Next slide, please. In terms of what um, AFCOM has been doing around, like, what does PrEP advocacy look like? Uh, you know, we're looking at um, including that into the prevention spending of the national HIV framework and strategy. So what is currently there, I think, is good enough for prevention. Uh, but, you know, with this integrated uh, PEP in, in it as well, we would ensure that we, you know, we fast track and also reach 1990 because in Asia uh, Pacific region, uh, the epidemic is largely driven by the MSM. So the current um, prevention is current. Yeah, it's not enough. It's nowhere near enough. So we need to be able to kind of like you know we see this use of prep as a potential to really uh, change that dynamic and ensuring that the communities are very much involved in the uh, delivery of um, information, education to the communities, and then also be able to link um, the different services as well at the country level. So it's not just about um, you know, advocating for PrEP in itself, it's actually about linking people to HIV testing and then about how community can then, you know, for example, serve as a, uh, uh, in the, the initial um, testing before they link to uh, you know, care and support and then you know, to, on to PrEP and you know, other um, prevention strategies as well. And I think this way we'll, we'll encourage um, information and access to um, to hopefully the kind of affordability of PrEP in the future. So I've put in there some of the kind of means that we created for the, for the workshop to kind of like get people, you know, know more, uh, you know, get guys to understand like what, what, what PrEP is about in terms of, um, you know, being effective and um, the preventive uh, message. Next slide, please. 
One of the really exciting things that um, Apple has been doing in Bangkok is a testing campaign called um, TaxBKK. And, you know, we, we know that the current PrEP information is not available in many of the local languages in our region. So there's a poor knowledge about PrEP in our region. So what TaxBKK has done is actually looking at um, how then we can translate the kind of like the sex positive image and also giving information about, about PrEP at the same time. So here we have um, four of the, uh, of the posters uh, in Thai um, talking about uh, kind of like sex positivity. So the first one on the left is that, you know, um, um, sex without fear. Uh, and the second one is that, you know, uh, fun without fear. The third one is uh, about, um, it's about for, so this is for sex workers, so um, work without fear. And the last one is intimacy without fear. So it kind of has messages about sex positivity and it has a little bit of information about PrEP, which links into the website, and then it takes them to information of where they can access you know, testing and then where can they also access PrEP as well. And that kind of like, you know, ensures that um, the, the message also links into the services. So there is, you know, in our region, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a belief in low efficacy of PrEP and concern about moving away from condom-based uh, messages and prevention. But what we're saying here is that, you know, this is in on top of the current strategies that is currently being employed at country level. Um, so they can also already integrate that into the current um, service delivery model. Just last week, um, Thailand has got uh, the Songkran uh, Festival, which is our traditional new year, where a lot of gay guys from across the region come to Bangkok to party in gay circuits. And uh, we were able to give kind of uh, the, the messages around PrEP in, uh, in the GFK parties through um, having a booth with um, condom to loop uh, uh, distribution and also a leaflet about, about PrEP so then they can go and uh, study about it from our website as well. Next slide, please. And so these are the, the resources produced by Upcom on PrEP that uh, might be useful or helpful to uh, other advocates and activists to, um, to study and use for your own country um, discussions as well, and share with your friends who have a, a better understanding of, of what PrEP is and what it is isn't. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Midnight. While we get Will uh, on deck and ready to go and get up to his slides, there is one clarifying question briefly. Would APCOM consider including women in their campaign posters? Sorry, what's the question again? So Midnight, the question is, Hello? would APCOM consider would APCOM consider including women in your prep campaign posters? Um, so, our, so our campaign is very much about um, targeted to um, to gay men so, and MSM. And you know, in terms of uh, providing support to other organisations that want to look at um, other populations, you know, I think we can provide that technical support. And we've been supporting different organisations in the region uh, in terms of how they can conduct. Uh, a country consultation and what kind of um, messages they would like to develop, and we can help you know um, create and create that uh, messages with the uh, with the partners. So it thank you very much. Things, but it has to be targeted to the population. Absolutely, thank you so much, Min. Thank you for uh, he wins the prize for joining us the latest that night as far as the presenters go. So thank you, Midnight. I remind everyone to please press star six. Keep your phone muted unless you're speaking. Um, or use your mute function on your phone so we have no background noise. Uh, also, I hope people will be able to hang out with us for a few minutes after the hour since we got started late and we have some great presentations. Next, we'll be hearing briefly from the wonderful Dr. Will Nutland with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, also the person, one of the driving forces behind Prepster and some major advocacy um, happening in the UK right now around Prep. I'm sure everyone is. Uh, familiar with what has been happening there. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Will right now to take us through his slides. Thanks, Will. Thank you, Jim. It's an absolute pleasure to be joining you. I'm actually in Manchester right now. There's the British 
HIV Association conference um, happening right now in Manchester, and I'm up here with a bunch of other PrEP activists to put on an event in conjunction with the Lesbian and Gay Bisexual Transgender Foundation here in Manchester this evening. So I'm going to speed through my slides very quickly to help us get, back, get us back up to time, but I just want to um, build on something that Nick talked about. So in England right now, we do not need European Medical Agency approval for PrEP. We need the National Health Service with NHS England to make a decision to sign off PrEP and make it available. They could do that right now. Next slide, please. And what some of you might have been following is that we have, in the last few weeks, the last month, seen NHS England do a complete U-turn on the formal consultation process that we've been working on for the last 18 months. So some of you have been probably following that. The consultation process was on. A month ago it was off, and then if you were following our news yesterday, it's back on. So in one of the questions I was asked is, what does, what does advocacy for PrEP look like? Advocacy for PrEP looks like legal action, coordinated, concerted, coalition building around legal action led by people uh, like the National AIDS Trust. Next slide, please. But what does it also look like? It looks like angry, noisy, galvanizing, galvanizing activists bashing pots and pans and going into NHS England and telling them that we're not going to be quiet about PrEP. Next slide, please. It also looks like this. It looks like one of the nine actions that we're asking people through PrEPster to take about PrEP. That involves the slow burn of lobbying, writing, challenging stigma, talking to your friends. We think talking to your friends is activism and advocacy like the event we're doing in Manchester tonight. Next slide, please. But advocacy also looks like this. I Want Prep Now is the sister website with Prepster, and I Want Now have really been pushing forward access to generic prep, prep in England. How might that happen? Well, firstly, they've been identifying safe, reliable sources of PrEP that people can buy online. Nick's already reminded us that you don't need a prescription to buy generic PrEP in England, and so long as you're buying three months' supply for personal use, overall you shouldn't be running into any problems around the law. So we're identifying safe, reliable sources. We're assisting people in getting therapeutic drug monitoring. So we know right now that we have data from between 75 to 80 people who have taken generic PrEP for a couple of weeks, have then have a TDM test done, and are sharing the results of that TDM test along with their batch numbers to other people throughout the country and beyond. We've also built fantastic relationships with clinical service providers. So right now, the pioneer PrEP users are creating the roadmap for how PrEP services will operate in the future when PrEP becomes available in the UK. We're also getting support from clinicians. Nick's also kind of touched on this, who are offering things like kidney tests. Bear in mind that six months ago, just six months ago, when we approached clinicians in England to get support in doing this, most of them ran away from us. Right now, they're working hand in glove with us as clinician activists to get PrEP available to as many people as possible. But we have three broad sets of concerns, and I think PrEP on the Wild could assist us in helping to work some of this out. So despite our attempts, we know that there are people who aren't following the full PrEP program. We know for sure because of the people we're speaking to online, the people we're tweeting with, the people we're meeting in bars and clubs, that some people are going straight onto PrEP without having kidney function tests and without having regular HIV tests. And this is a problem of a stopgap suboptimal provision of PrEP. Our second issue is that we don't know how many people are using PrEP. PrEP in the Wild can help us work this out. So we know that there are 400 people on the PROUD trial, but we would probably estimate that there are at least another 400, if not double that number of people who are now buying generic PrEP online. We also know there are people who are clinic hopping. We also know that there are people sharing pills. I'm going to finish by raising one key concern that we're alarmed about, and that is the most marginalized people and possibly those with the greatest need are those people who can least afford or are least able to get generic PrEP online. And that might be because they don't have financial capital, that they don't have social capital, or for example, they don't have a safe address where they can get those generics sent to. So there's a real danger that PrEP remains a boutique drug, drug for a bunch of privileged people, and those people who are most marginalized, migrants, young queer people, sex workers, are those who are going to be left out. Spot on five minutes, there you go. 
You are fantastic. Thank you, Will. The work you guys have been doing in the UK is really amazing and exciting, and we're watching it, you know, with bated breath. Hope, hope you're successful. Um, you've come a long way in a short amount of time. We have one quick clarifying question. What are your uh, thoughts around providing PrEP without a prescription? Okay, so um, my thoughts are that right now it's a quick and easy way to get PrEP, so I'm getting my PrEP without a prescription. We know that probably insisting on prescription being available for generic PrEP will be an obstacle for some of us to get PrEP because our doctors may not want to or may not be willing to offer a, prep, offer a prescription, particularly if we're buying online. Thank you, Will. Thank you so much. You're welcome, We're going to move on. We're going to move on to our next wonderful speaker um, and remind folks who are not speaking to uh, mute their phone or uh, by pressing star six or using the mute function on their phone. I am hearing some background noise. Uh, I'm going to introduce now Ricardo Baruch Dominguez, who's an assistant researcher for the Center for Health Systems Research in Mexico. He's also a PhD student at the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico and he's an activist on LGBT rights, and we're really excited to have him here today to talk about PrEP in Latin America. Ricardo? And Ricardo, if you had muted yourself, you need to star seven to unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me now? We can. Hi, I'm everyone. wondering, he younger or Mickey, we are having a lot of background noise. Can we perhaps do a global mute and then have the presenters unmute themselves? The conference okay. has been muted. Ricardo, please press. Is that you, Ricardo? Ricardo, we're going to need you to press. Is that you, Ricardo? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to to be here with all of you. And I'm going to talk very briefly about the situation of prep in Latin America, particularly in Mexico, where it's where I've been doing some uh, some rich research around prep. So mm, next slide, please. Uh, first of all, I would like to clarify that. The, um, like when, I, when I'm talking about Latin America, we're excluding the Caribbean, where the situation with the HIV epidemic is quite different. So in most of the countries in Latin America, the, the HIV epidemic is concentrated among MSN and, and trans women. So um, as probably most of you know, there's a lot of uh, research that is showing that uh, PrEP could be like a, a great uh, com combination prevention intervention for uh, for this kind of key population, so we have an, a big opportunity here um, in order to to stop the HIV epidemic uh, eventually if we focus our, our our efforts in the in the people who are most affected. And so far, um, Latin America uh, has was um, uh, the base of, of some of the research around PrEP among MSM and trans women, particularly Brazil, Ecuador, and, and Peru. And, uh, but it's important to mention that no country except Peru that is starting to, to the process of registering Trubada has, has been approved the uh, PrEP officially. Um, so this is, just, uh, this is just starting. And also I think something important to, to mention is that uh, in, in most of the countries in the region, the, the public health systems are the ones financing the, the majority of the HIV response. So there is some money from international donors, but it's mostly uh, the, the, the government of each country that is paying for the HIV response, which is something different to many other parts of the developing world. And in that sense, uh, even though there's like a relatively high access for example, to antiretroviral for people living with HIV, um, most of the governments are saying that are not, they are not capable to paying more for, the, for their HIV responses, which is a, could, could be potentially a big challenge for, for implementing PrEP in the future. Next slide, please. So when Nick was talking about the situation in Germany, I was, uh, I was thinking that it's very, very similar to the situation in, uh, in Mexico in, in many different senses. 
For example, uh, the prices of antiretrovirals around the, the region are very different. They can go as, uh, from as cheap to $14 a month in some countries in Central America, such as Guatemala, Nicaragua, and Honduras. They can be as high as $200 uh, in Mexico because uh, the, the government here in Mexico, due to the North American Free Trade Agreement and other uh, trade agreements, uh, is not allowed to buy generic drugs, so we have to import the like the, uh, the original drugs. Therefore, the prices are really high, and that's something that uh, that may prevent the government to uh, implement this kind of program. But uh, th there is some progress that I'm gonna mention just in a few minutes. Also, it is important that some of the uh, regional networks of key populations have identified that the, potentially the, some of those countries that are receiving money from the Global Fund could potentially include uh, PrEP for key populations, which is a, a great opportunity. But there is a lot of reluctance from uh, the activist community because there's a, a strong feeling that we first need to improve the uh, treatment and uh, access to testing and counseling before moving to something uh, as, as PrEP. And that's something that, for example, in Mexico is still a big challenge because even though there's supposed to be a universal access to ARV, uh, approximately one of every three MSM living with HIV doesn't know their status. So that's why a lot of people say, well, we first need to do this and then we can start discussing about, uh, about PrEP. But the reality is that there's a lot of PrEP in the wild particularly in Mexico, the fact that we are so close to the U.S. Uh, has um, made that there's a lot of information, which doesn't mean it's good information, but at least probably something that is already in the mind of a lot of particular gay men in some of the largest cities, such as Mexico City, Guadalajara, and Monterrey, that have a very strong uh, gay community. Um, so it's becoming very popular in the black market, whether it's uh, imported illegally from the U.S., or also there's like a black market from like people living with HIV who are selling their medication uh, or who are getting two medications from because they're, they, they have uh, access to two different health services. So that's, that's something that is uh, increasing. And they um, um, as a black market, that the original Truvada can be found at around $60 to $80. Next slide, please. Um, so what's next? Um, there, there's uh, uh, UNITAID, this uh, global uh, agency that's based in Geneva. It's funding for the first time uh, a project in Latin America that uh, is going to help to do some demonstrative research uh, about on PrEP for MSN in Mexico, Peru, and Brazil. So there's a lot of potential from uh, that if those, uh, that, that research goes well. May, there will be more information about what can be done in the region. And right now, Brazil is a, it was already uh, having uh, a large uh, PrEP program, so now it's going to be even uh, even larger. Uh, but it's, but still, it's only uh, as a research project. Also, there's a lot of information needed in in Spanish because uh, uh, there's information going around in, in in the internet and other spaces. Uh, in English, but there's very limited information in Spanish. Recently, we, we developed a, a short um, fact sheet, which uh, is the one I'm showing here. And if someone is interested, I'm happy to share it uh, with you uh, in Spanish to explain what is PrEP and also to say, well, it's not available yet, but it might be available in the next few uh, months or years in some, in some countries. And also, there's um, uh, there's an article that will be published in, in a few months in the journal of the IAS that I recommend you to read about, like that, that is examining all the situation in, uh, in some of the countries that have been doing uh, work around PrEP. And as I mentioned before, it's mostly Mexico, Peru, and Brazil, where there, there's been more progress and more discussion, not just uh, among the activists and, and the MSM, but also the researchers the government and also uh, there is a growing support from UN agencies, particularly UNAID and, uh, and WHO. So uh, I, I, uh, I think that yeah, th there is a, like there are good opportunities in the region, but we still need uh, to, to find out 
especially like how the financing uh, thing will work in the future. So I think that's it. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, that's it. Well, thank Great. you very thank much. Great. Thank you so. Thank you so much, Ricardo. Um, and and, and uh, to save a little bit of time, we're going to just keep going, and I'm going to introduce um, Brian Kanyumbo from the Desmond Tutu HIV Foundation. Brian has been a longtime HIV prevention advocate. He's also worked on clinical trials, helping recruit folks into microbicide trials and PrEP trials. He's now, uh, you know, in South Africa. He is in South Africa, which has recently approved PrEP. So they're moving from PrEP in the wild to more formal use, but I would imagine most use in, in South Africa is still um, on the informal side or in the wild side. But without further ado, um, I'd like to turn this uh, talk over to Brian Kanyemba. Please remember to star seven to unmute yourself. Okay, thank you so much, Jim, and thanks for the, for the introduction. So um, my talk today for the next five minutes is specifically uh, going to be what has been happening in the advocacy scene uh, since um, we are, since 2010, uh, uh, when we uh, we had the first prep trials until now, and what were the you know um, information that we are, we are getting from uh, folks within the the country. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think we are missing a, a sl some slides there. Hello? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that one. Okay. So, um when you are talking <laughs> So when you are when you are talking about prep, um in South Africa, we have uh, um, already started talking about PrEP as a targeted prevention packages for different uh, key populations using the um, UN AIDS key population guidelines, whereby we were taking uh, uh, female sex workers and male sex workers, people get drugs, MSM, and so discordant couples. So we were, uh, <clears throat> since uh, in 2012, we had a uh, recommendation on, on PrEP. So um, we had uh, started to have the discussion on um, what is really the prevention package that is needed among uh, these uh, key populations, especially into the other four. So now uh, when we are adding more um, on PrEP, we thought uh, let's bring young women into the mix and as we're having this discussion uh, because the uh, South African household uh, survey and our influence data is showing uh, that um, these young women are uh, very high at risk whereby we are, sh uh, are seeing that about 2,500 um, new infections are actually reported every week. So it thought, okay, women should actually be involved into, the, into, into this mix. Okay, next slide. Okay, so what is the approach uh, of PrEP in, in the world? So as I said, we are discussing and talking about this on the discussion that we had in South Africa. We thought, and um, uh, the community is actually thinking, PrEP should be kind-centered and friendly, something that an individual, you know, an ideal approach whereby it's an individual centered. For example, um, I have to make a choice which is suitable to me uh, and my lifestyle. And um, we have seen that data shows that when individuals are at risk, they are more liable to, uh, to, uh, to look for that uh, uh, intervention of their own uh, preferences, you know, and as as an individual, because this is prepping in the world, in the world, we would want to think how much does it cost, and who is going to pay for it? Does it um, meet my my budget? And um, if it's insurance, is it recommended? Will my insurance be able to cover for it? Which is um, most of the time not so, you know, uh, um, no, no, it's not that what is happening with some of the insurances. And again, looking onto this, that cost implication, another thing that is coming on is 
when we're talking about PrEP, it's in a combination with other interventions, you know, SDI testing, you know, um, HIV testing, and other um, um, monitoring that is needed. Is, that, is it covered by, by, by that course, and what will happen into, into, into that way? And now, where is it available? Is it in the public sector, or is it just in the, in, the, in the private sector? And looking into the human resources and structures in South Africa, in the public, do I have to wait in the queue? And is it really my lifestyle? I'm a working person. Do I really need to wait for this long? So we are taking it into the, as an individual, would I really um, um, take PrEP on my own without any other interference? And then uh, looking into the issues of adherence, who is supporting an individual in adherence, with, with adherence? Because for PrEP to work, one has got to adhere to, to, to it. Is it um, um, uh, support from the health um, sector with the healthcare worker, a, counselor, a counselor or a clinician, or on, let's say, for example, we're talking about a third screen couple, is it my partner who is actually supporting me on, on, um, with adherence? Next slide, please. So where is informal prep happening? Um, so, so far, um, it has been only happening um, among MSM, and we have seen themselves as um, at risk, and one of the one of the uh, uh, MSM had actually pu published his own article online. And it's you, for those who are interested to hear his story, you can go you can go on that link. And um, for those who will be at the regional um, meeting here in Africa in, in, in the next few few weeks, you will be available to actually engage further. But really, what he had come out with was prep. He has seen that prep as an individual. Um, um, a commitment that needs his, you know, uh, to actually think about it and how to take prep on for his own accord. And it is interesting that he is he was not even a participant and he was not uh, even involved in any, in any of the clinical trials and actually took prep on his own after he had had um, from from the media. So again, where is prep happening? Um, it is happening in our um, demonstration projects that we are conducting among MSM, sex workers and young, and young men. And um, however, um, this is a tailor method to attract the right population through targeted desi uh, designed advertisement. And one thing that is happening with our, within our demonstration project is there are more of nurses, in, nurses initiated project uh, in our two clinics in Johannesburg in Cape Town. And, and really this is um, something that is interesting since one of the questions that is coming in from the government is what about human resources and this nurses initiated project is really great into that regard. Next slide please. So what is the studied procedure? Um, so um, uh, just a few weeks ago, we have got new guidelines, and as I said before, um, which include all the other key populations, including young women, girls. And uh, the guidelines point out point the fact that HIV testing um, should be done after every three months when you come in to, to collect your your medication. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the SDI testing, I think, I know I mentioned it, uh, but um, since um, most of our, m most of the discussion that we had in the community is when taking PrEP, uh, most of us, most of the community members, they are actually not using condoms anymore, so there's an influx of STIs which, 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 has, been, which has been reported. So now, um, so after every, um, when a participant comes in for a visit to collect his next medication, there is a really an, a robust discussion that should go between the clinician and the the person themselves. And again, um, the medical monitoring include include you know the side effects, you know, um, uh, help manage AB management and and other side effects. So. Um, 
all this information has been collected since um, we had our last guidelines in 2012 and which was only limited to MSM, but uh, again, it had actually helped out to explore more, especially from the studies that we had from ADAPT and Partners Prep. Next slide, please. So where is advocacy in South Africa? Um, <clears throat> It's actually civil society supported whereby prevention advocates um, like myself uh, we've been having discussions mainly uh, on the TV, in print media, and in talk shows, or, at, or, or targeting conferences, whereby uh, we are sh sharing the information and prep and what it means, and we should be um, we should, uh, and targeting different population, not not just gen the general key population, and. Um, our implementation partners like um, CDC uh, have been working uh, on costing of PrEP specifically for the key populations that, that I have just mentioned and the National Department of Health. Uh, they are supporting the research efforts and um, were pushed on licensure, which was uh, PrEP was was licensed in November last year, and they've now created a working group that is um, working on how do we structure and put uh, our, our PrEP into practice. And again, um, I mentioned uh, that uh, individuals who are taking PrEP uh, in the world are actually sharing their, their experience. And um, there's a, uh, um, last week there was a group of clinicians uh, among uh, clinician society who are you know, talking about PrEP um, among themselves, how, how can they support each other, especially when it comes to, to prep uh, 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 implementation, you know, to write prescription and et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, how can, uh, what can we, you know, uh, uh, gain from a, a survey on, on prep in the, in the world? So I think uh, democracies and clinical trials are giving us more clinical controlled acceptability and, and social mobilization. So we need to have more, you know, um, uh, out of clinic, uh, clinic self intro introspection whereby we would want to hear more what the end user is saying and that drive of, 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 of using PrEPs. So uh, perhaps this might uh, contribute to the acceptability of, of PrEP in the community. Next slide, please. So what is the public perception on PrEP? There are really mixed feelings, and um, we need this need uh, to create acceptability of PrEP as in prevention intervention, and uh, we need to know where is service provision uh, for PrEP. Is it in the public or is it in the private clinics or only MSM run clinics, which is uh, what is happening right now? And again, uh, um, since we have got an already burdened health sector, uh, what should we do about it? So this is coming in very, very um, from the from the community, and um, the the community is actually asking a question: What is the Department of Health have in rolling out of prep? What are what is what are the structure? So we need that we have uh, um, on 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 the table. And again, uh, the last thing is. Um, we, we as advocates, we are trying to make sure that we are saying that PrEP is not a competitor for treatment and that PrEP uh, go, is going in as in the box of treatment and then uh, uh, they are working together. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. And in the, uh, to save a few more seconds here, I'm going to move it right over to Jerome Gallia, who is a co-PI on the PrEP in the Wild survey. His current gig is with Socios and Salud, or Partners in Health, um, and he is one of the co-founders of Irma in Latin America. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jerome right now. Hi. Thanks, Jim. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Great. Thanks for the introduction, and thank you to all of the presenters. That was really more than I could, I think more than we could hope for in an hour. And so I just want to cap this off with a, a a, a brief prepared statement um, about the PrEP in the Wild study. Um, I think by now if you've um, been listening to the speakers, you can see that there's just lots of questions about what's happening with the use of um, PrEP off-label. But I wanted to tell you about how we got started on the study and then also ask for your help 
in um, distributing this global online survey to your friends and colleagues. Um, and so what happened was that about a year ago, uh, exactly, a friend here in Peru called me on a Monday morning, as has often happened to me, um, telling me about a, um, an experience he had a few days before within 72 hours where he felt like he had been um, exposed and possibly infected with HIV, and he wanted uh, to access post-exposure prophylaxis or PEP. So I made the referral, um, and he finished the, uh, the PEP course, and afterwards he was interested in starting PrEP. Um, and that's where um, the story begins, because in Peru right now, although it was uh, Truvada um, for PrEP, use was just approved by our equivalent of the, of the FDA. It is not included in the national um, HIV strategy yet. But at that time, anyhow, um, as well as today, what he had to do was figure out how he could purchase PrEP informally. And so it got me really thinking about PrEP use off-label. I, I can't say that I had thought about it much before then. Um, and really what was happening in places where PrEP is not officially approved for prevention. And so um, at that time, I'd only really heard about this anecdotally in Peru. Um, I did find one study that was uh, published about informal PrEP use um, in Australia, but that was it. And so that's when, um, whenever I have questions about prevention, of course, I turn to, to my friend, um, Jim Pickett, and we started talking about this, and we both agreed that um, like I think many of us do, that PrEP should be part of an overall prevention toolbox. But at the same time, we don't really see it as a do-it-yourself intervention, um, and that there really are other things should be taken in consideration besides HIV, like one's medical history, testing for other STI, individual risk profile, et cetera. And so that's when uh, we started conversation with Pamina Gorbach, um, who's um, a behavior epidemiologist at UCLA, many of you know her, and our friends at AVAC, uh, like Mitch Warren, who's also interested in this issue. And um, AVAC agreed to support a small investigation about the informal use of PrEP, which we call PrEP in the wild. So that's how, um, and during many conversations with I think many of you on this call over the last few months of 2015, we developed the PrEP in the wild study that is for people, men and women, who take PrEP in places where it is not yet approved for such use or where it is approved but the meds are obtained through informal mechanisms. And so we're also interested but not only on the user's or consumer's experience, but we'd like to know what the provider's experience are because in many of these situations, um, people may consult with their physicians. And so the PrEP in the Wild survey also con includes questions for healthcare professionals who manage patients taking PrEP uh, regardless of how they get it. So finally, um, we also know that there, there have been some people who have tried to acquire PrEP but have been unsuccessful in doing so, and so we include some questions for that group as well. So um, the study has been vetted by several advocates and medical professionals, many of you on this call, um, as well as reviewed by an ethics committee. You should know that all the responses are anonymous, and the survey is available in three different flavors, English, Spanish, and French for now. We plan to run the survey for several months and report our findings here in another global call as well in other scientific forums. So please, um, the last slide shows you the link that will take you to all three languages for the PrEP. We really are asking, this is a low budget <laughs> endeavor, um, it's internet based, we really are asking your help to spread this to your friends and colleagues. And for specific questions, um, you can always contact me or Jim Pickett. Thanks, Jim. I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Jerome. And thanks to all our presenters. Thanks to all the participants who have hung out with us on this call today and uh, bearing with us with some of the tech issues, including internet outage, right when we were about to get started. Um, if I could ask the presenters to all uh, unmute their phones, we're going to do a quick a set of final questions. We don't have a lot of time. I'm going to take a minute or two. One question I can answer, I think, on behalf of everybody, it was requested if um, your various informational, educational, and communication materials could be shared. Um, I think it was directed towards AFCON, but I think it would go for anybody. 
yes, they are willing to share, uh, Jordan. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get in contact with any of them directly or through me, I can make sure you get that hookup. Um, this is directly for Will. Will, uh, there was a question about um, the – well, here's the question. The EMA Euro approval is not associated with the delay of approval in the UK. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Great. Um, there's another but, sort of oh, general oh, – Jim, but for England, not, not the whole of the UK. My understanding is that EMA will, will apply for Scotland. Oh, but I, I, very I good could, clarification. I could stand corrected for that. Okay. And if Nick, are you still on the call? Is there anything you'd want to add to that question? Yes, I am. EMA, is there anything you need to add to that the, about the EMA Euro approval and its association with England slash UK? Uh, no, basically we just have to wait for it just the way our, our health system is set up. Um, and actually, um, because our Ministry of Health is not very keen on PrEP, well, they kind of hide behind this, saying, well, you know, we can't do anything before the EMA approval. Ah, right. We know that trick. Um, here's mm -hmm. a question for everybody. This is a yes or no quick question. Um, but have you all consulted with any sex workers, whether they're male, female, or transgender, mm -hmm. around their concerns about PrEP so that they can be included in your advocacy work? Yes. That was Will who said yes. Yeah. And, and Jim, we're actually just about to start working on a project called Porn for Prep UK, when we're working with a bunch of um, porn sex workers on a on a fantastic new education project. Oh, cool. And the other folks, Minnet, are you still uh, on? Yes. So this is, uh, yes. Hi. Yes, I'm still here. Yes, midnight. Um, there will be um, a, a prep study that's going to be specifically for um, a male sex worker, uh, um, young um, sex worker. Uh, in Bangkok next year. Excellent. Is there anyone else who wants to add to the question about your, if you've worked with sex workers or in planning to do any consultations or advocacy with sex workers in regards to PrEP? Hi, this is yes. Ricardo here. Um, and, Go ahead, Ricardo. Um, yeah, well, uh, Brazil, uh, I, I understand that the studies in Brazil and Peru did involve sex workers. Uh, but uh, I'm not aware of any uh, program specific for uh, sex workers in the future, except like for particularly for women, but trans women are definitely included in some of the plans for some countries. Okay. Uh, anyone else want to go ahead? Yes, Jim. It's, yeah, it's Brian. So um, we, are, we are working directly with, uh, with SWITCH, which is our sex work um, uh, partner here in Cape Town. And we have been engaging them through the uh, through the results, and there are actually a number of, of male sex workers who are on one of our demonstration projects. And I understand uh, uh, Kevin had registered on the call. He has been engaging them as a clinician on on um, on, on on prep, you know, uh, on how they can get prep etc. So yes, great. Well, thank you, presenters, again. Thank you all for being here. Thanks, AVAC, for um, uh, hosting this call. We are going to have to cut it now. If you have questions that you didn't get answered or something that comes up later, please feel free to send that to me directly, jpickett at aidschicago.org. That's jpickett at aidschicago.org. Uh, we need to um, sign off now, but again, thank you very much for being here. Thanks to uh, our partners, Irma, Socios and Salud, UCLA, and of course, AVAC for not only providing um, webinar capabilities today, but funding this lovely study prep in the wild. Please take Jerry's words to heart and help us share that link far and wide with both consumers and providers in whatever country. This is a global survey. We want responses as, from as many places, from as many people as possible. Thank you very much. With that said, stay tuned, watch this space, keep up the good work everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day, afternoon, or evening. Bye-bye.